Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. I'm your host, Jakari Jackson. It is April 29th, 2016, and here's a look at our top stories. Tonight, anti-Trump agitators are triggered into a riot in Southern California as InfoWars captures the chaos from the land of idiocracy. I just saw, they just got triggered by asking. Then, the surveillance state comes out in the open, and there is now a Supreme Court ruling that officially allows the FBI to hack and surveil your computer. And a bong hit just cost a top NFL prospect a whopping $8 million. All that, <coughs> plus much more up next on the InfoWars Nightly News. Now, coming up later in our show, we'll have footage of our crew out in California. They went to a Trump demonstration or anti-Trump demonstration last night, and they caught a lot of violence on camera. Like I said, we'll show you those videos later on. But if you go to the top of Drudge, that's all the rage. That's all they're talking about right now. Trump is actually at a different event as we speak, meeting with various people, and there were protesters out there to greet him. Now, the issue I have with these protests or protesters more accurately is the way that they're going about it. I talked about this last, last time with the self-righteous social justice warrior, this person who is so angry at Trump or any political contender for that matter, that they feel it is perfectly acceptable to go out to a protest and spin people's faces, to pepper spray little girls, uh, to do donuts in the street and endanger other people. This is the mindset that these people have. You know, I'm not a Trump demonstrator, you guys know that. I'm not a uh, Hillary supporter, I'm not a Bernie supporter. With all that said, I would not go to a Hillary Clinton event and pepper spray little girls in the face or pepper spray somebody who is around little girls. I wouldn't go to a Bernie demonstration and do donuts in the street and endanger the people out there. I wouldn't go to a Trump demonstration and punch somebody in the face. It's how these people are acting. Meanwhile, they wanna call him a racist, fascist, a uh, sexist, bigot, whatever, you know, they want to call him this week. And a lot of times when they talk to these guys, if you watch the videos that are coming up, they ask them, what is your issue with Donald Trump? And they'll, for many, as many things that you could say legitimately about the guy, you could talk about uh, the torture aspect or the wall or the lack of uh, domestic privacy. He wants to, you know, have all these measures to get into your uh, devices and all that. Legitimate criticism of the guy, but people will say he... He's uh, violent against Mexicans. I'm like, when did he say he's violent against Mexicans? I'm as skeptical about the guy as many of the people at that demonstration. I've never heard him say that. Similar things when he talks, when people talk about uh, he's violent against Muslims. I've never heard him say he wants to be violent towards Muslims. Now, he did say he wants to uh, torture the families or is up to torture the families of terrorism suspects. Those people aren't always necessarily Muslim. But that's really the only violence I've heard come out of the guy's mouth or, you know, uh, condoning the violence. Other than that, these people don't even want to criticize him for the things that he actually said and believes. They just want to go out there and endanger other people for their own means. But we'll have all those videos coming up here shortly. And as I was talking about the surveillance apparatus with Trump, we now see this article. Supreme Court ruling allows FBI to hack and surveil computers. Prior to the decision, Rule 41 of the Federal Rules of Criminal Procedure authorized search and seizure by law enforcement only within their own jurisdiction. Approved amendments to the code now permit the FBI and others to hack into computers and seize data, even if that computer's actual location has been concealed through technical means such as Tor. As it stands, the proposed amendments allow the FBI to use a wide array of invasive and potentially destructive hacking techniques where it may not be necessary to do so. Basically, if you think about the old warrant system, you had to say, what you were searching, where it's gonna be, you know, who's involved, all this stuff. Now they're saying with these new changes, they could say you could be potentially anywhere out of the jurisdiction of the FBI and they can still come and confiscate your materials, search your materials, uh, do anything that they wanna do. And we're getting more and more towards this mindset. If you think about the situation now, a lot of law enforcement agencies around the country are starting to do this thing where you get pulled over and they wanna look in your phone. You know, for really no reason, you know, you get pulled over for a bus to tell like they could potentially say, I want to look at your phone, see if you were texting. He's like, I wasn't texting. My phone was in my pocket or it's in my purse or whatever else. But they just 
use this as an excuse to check your data. A similar thing uh, when you look at the Apple phone and the whole recent controversy with that, they said that they wanted Apple to build a backdoor for them to use anytime they felt like it, but it's only a one-time deal. People didn't buy that. <laughs> so uh, eventually they hacked a phone and spent millions of dollars or at least a million dollars to do so. And they're not any better for it. In my personal opinion, John McAfee told them how to hack the phone without using all this expensive equipment. But bureaucracy wouldn't allow that to happen. They had to spend money and make a big deal out of it just to uh, get in Apple's face about it. It seems like every day they find a new way to take our privacy away from us when it comes to our electronic devices. Now I want to talk about a story that's going on overseas, uh, not so much the lack of privacy, but the lack of life that's going on in Syria. Uh, the Syrian conflict has been going on for some time. It's been heating, escalating, and now this is the latest in a string of attacks. Syrian airstrikes hit hospital, kill at least 20 in Aleppo. Several airstrikes hit a well-known hospital in a rebel-held area of Aleppo, killing at least 20 people, including three children, a dentist, and one of the last pediatricians left in the divided city, the Syrian Observatory for Human Rights Monitoring Group said on Thursday. Doctors Without Borders said 14 patients at the hospital it backs were among the dead. Opposition leaders blamed the government of Assad. Now, I was trying to do some research and make sure that this was Assad. Uh, multiple news agencies are saying that it is Assad, but I'm always skeptical when I hear things of that. Not that Assad is a good guy, but we've seen multiple times they try to blame him for stuff that he didn't do. Uh, case in point, the chemical weapons attacks, I believe, of 2013, if I remember correctly. Basically, if you guys remember those attacks, uh, it was all over the news on uh, mainstream media here in the States that Assad was running around tear gassing people or uh, chemical weaponing, uh, using chemical weapons to kill people. And the issue about that was if you look at those videos in the corner, they had a watermark that was Al Qaeda watermark or, you know, these uh, extremist group watermarks. I'm like, well, why would Assad uh, film these things, put them up on the Internet with the watermark? It was complete bull. So I'm always skeptical. But for right now, I'll take their word for it that it was Assad. And hopefully we'll get some uh, cooler heads to prevail out there and get some uh, answers as to why this hospital was destroyed. But now we have new answers or the answers that they want us to hear as far as why the hospital was destroyed last year. If you guys recall the attack in Afghanistan where the Doctors Without Borders facility in Afghanistan was hit by U.S. artillery. And we see this Pentagon announces punishments in deadly hospital attack. And this is back in October of 2015, a U.S. aerial gunship attack on a hospital in Afghanistan that killed at least 42 people occurred because of human errors, process mistakes, and equipment failures. And none of the air crew or U.S. ground troops knew the target was a hospital, a top U.S. general said Friday. Now, once again, uh, this somewhat conflicts with what we've heard from Doctors Without Borders. They've been saying that they knew that it was, in fact, a hospital. They'd been operating out of there for some time. The rationale at the time, back in October 2015, was that uh, militants were using this facility for some reason. I don't know if that's true. Maybe them, they went in at some point to get patched up, but it wasn't a official base of operations. That's what Doctors Without Borders is saying. And now they're saying that uh, 16 military members from this incident have been disciplined, but none will face charges. And I'm very interested to hear that. If you go to a hospital right now in the United States of America and light a trash can fire, you are going to jail. But if you blow up a hospital, kill, what, 42 people? They just say uh, it was an equipment failure, mistakes were made. There's no reason to investigate this any further. The guys retired when this attack happened, and uh, they've been disciplined, but nobody's actually going to go to jail or face any charges. Now, once again, when you talk about these attacks overseas, whether it's a, a manned gunship or a drone or whatever, these guys are hitting targets that they're told to hit. So I'm not even so much mad at the... Uh, individuals in the gunship or the uh, drone operators, they're being told hit X target, you know, an X area and take it out. So it's really the guys who give the orders, not so much the guys who pull the trigger, even though you do have a manner of discretion in that, or at least I'd hope you would. Uh, so that's always the deal. There's no sense of accountability. And that's the big issue with the drone program. And now we're even seeing it with gunships. Nobody wants to be held responsible because you guys have seen that old video, that WikiLeaks video of the helicopter flying around and uh, these guys are carrying their camera equipment and they shoot down at them and kill them or they, you know, they injure them very severely. Some of them died. And then another guy pulls up 
in a minivan, you know, terrorist looking minivan. Every, everybody knows they drive one of those. Has his kids in the car, gets out to help the guy. Now they're shooting at the kids in the minivan. And it's completely ridiculous. And then you can hear one of the guys up in the gunship who's saying, well, they shouldn't bring their kids to a battle zone. It's like, well, they live there. They don't have any place to go. That's where their home is. The little bit that they have is based in that country, in that area, in that region. They can't just pick up sticks and move down I-35 like I could living here in Austin and go down to San Antonio. It's not an option for everybody out there. So I really wish people would get rid of that mentality. It sucks for them type of mentality because sooner or later, uh, that type of mentality will come home to you. And speaking of a guy who's not going to be coming home anytime soon, we see that North Korea has sentenced another American to hard labor. Now, this particular guy is being sentenced for spying a very serious offense in any country. So I'm not coming down too hard on him for that. But if you guys remember, I believe it was just last month, we gave you the story about the American student who went overseas, North Korea. He stole a poster, a poster of all things. And they gave him 15 years hard labor, and he is basically being used as a political pawn. And that's the same thing they say here in this article. It's got just a political football to be used at a later date uh, whenever it seats, uh, suits North Korea to try to make some type of exchange or whatever they might want to do with the uh, unfortunate gentleman. And this is Kim Dong Chul. They say he's been spying for a little bit of time now. Let's talk about some things going on here in the States. Now, I will caution you, the next story I'm about to mention isn't the most hard-hitting news of the day, but I think it is interesting as a sign of the times and just a general view of American culture. The bong hit that cost a top NFL prospect $8 million. Now, basically, if you don't know, this is a young NFL recruit who had, you know, smoked some bongs <laughs> like, uh, like Lord Vader. Was that, what movie was that? He's like, Luke, I am your stoner. That's what that guy looks like right there. Anyway, this is uh, Laramie Tunsil. Uh, he's an NFL prospect. And basically, he admitted to smoking a bong some time ago. He said it was a dumb mistake. He wouldn't do it again. But right before the NFL draft, somebody posted a video. He said somebody hacked his account, put this video on his social media. Maybe the NFL saw it. Maybe they didn't. And he dropped uh, several notches in the draft because of that, or people speculate he's supposed to be uh, taken by the Baltimore Ravens uh, as a number six pick for $20 million. He ended up going 13th to the Miami Dolphins for $12 million. Now, once again, I'm not crying for the guy. He's still making $12 million. But the point I'm trying to make with this is when we look at the sports stars, the uh, celebrities and, you know, Kardashians, whoever, I think American culture is so keen on coming down hard on these guys for doing things in their personal time. Case in point, if you guys recall Michael Phelps back in 2009, was it? Uh, after he won all these Olympic gold medals, they said he was Captain America. You know, he's on... Sports Illustrated and the Wheaties box, and he's got all these medals, and they want to come down hard on this guy because they saw him smoking uh, some, some marijuana after the Olympics were over. First of all, he wasn't even smoking during the Olympics, thus is my understanding, and even if he was, marijuana is not a performance-enhancing drug as far as I'm aware, and it wasn't just uh, Michael Phelps that they want to demonize. It was other guys like Ricky Williams, the NFL player, the, uh, the pro wrestler Rob Van Dam, a bunch of guys who uh, use marijuana in their own personal time. But the point I'm making is, like a lot of the parents or the naysayers who want to come down hard on these athletes, they're addicted to Oxycontin. They go drunk drive after they leave the bar. This, this is a true story. Back when I used to work at the jail when I was in Oklahoma, there were two guys who were sitting right next to each other. I can't remember exactly what they were arrested for, but one guy had an alcohol-related offense, and the other guy had a drug-related offense. And the alcohol guy was sitting up there all you know, snobby and snooty, talking down to the guy who got arrested on the drug charge. Meanwhile, they're both sitting in the county jail. And it's just the mentality. The alcohol guy was like, my high is legal, so I'm better than you. And I think that's the mentality when we look at uh, drug offenses here in the United States of America, especially when it goes to our celebrity. It's one of those things that, you know, you need to pull the beam out of your own eye before you worry about the speck in someone else's. And this is <laughs> the perfect lead-in. I wasn't even planning this. But now Bill Nye and the head of the Weather Channel, or should I say the founder of the Weather Channel, are now going at it over the film, The Climate Hustle. Basically, the founder of the Weather Channel is saying that global warming, man-made global warming, is a hoax. It's a pseudoscience. And Bill Nye is saying, no, of these climate change deniers need to be put in jail. So now they're going at it. And he's saying that Bill Nye, the founder, is saying that Bill Nye is a fake or a pretend scientist in a bow tie. Now, I'm not a climatologist, I'm not a meteorologist or any ologist, but basically my 
opinion is this. Every time I talk to somebody about global warming, let's say everything about global warming we hear is true hook, line, and sinker. What is paying a private carbon tax to Al Gore going to do to stop the problem? Me being a single male who lives in a one bedroom apartment and owns one vehicle, why should I have to pay a carbon tax when all these other people have way more money and putting out much more carbon than I do? That's just a basic argument I have to people. It's more than that I'd like to exchange with you, but I don't have the time for it. We're gonna move on now to our next article about an 11 year old boy who shot a home intruder and said that he started to cry like a baby. I told him I was gonna kill him all that with a gun if he didn't get out of my house. Like when he was coming downstairs and told me he was gonna kill me and F you all that. I shot through a hamper that he was carrying and it, went, it was a full metal jacket bullet. I went straight through the bag and hit him and was like, and he started crying like a little baby. I hope you learned a lesson from coming to this house trying to steal stuff. And finally for tonight, before we go into more special reports, how to quit your job and travel for two years. Now, this is a good story. I think it's just about saving money. Regardless if you want to quit your job or you want to travel, they have some basic common sense things you can do in this article to save money. So hopefully you won't have to work as hard and will actually be able to take a vacation. Now stay tuned because right after this break, we'll have more special reports. We'll have the crew out in California and you can see all the crazy things that went on there for yourself. So Cynthia McKinney joins us, allthingscynthiamckinney.com. She's got a couple of websites. I'm not sure which one we should give out, but Dr. McKinney, it is great to have you on with us. I know that you originally wanted to pop on about Beyonce uh, and, and, and my point that this NFL, CIA funded, that's been admitted, Pentagon funded, her message where it looks like it's empowering in my view is meant to get people at each other's throats, to cause division, uh, to cause war on the streets while we're looted uh, by the controllers. And you wanted to pop on and give your view on this and more, because I know you're an expert from being inside it, but also from studying it uh, on the type of psychological warfare going on. So Dr. McKinney, thanks for joining us. Well, thank you so much, Alex. For well, I, I'm sorry, we've been having so many Skype problems. Like we may have to start abandoning Skype uh, yeah, in just a moment. Let me just stop you for a moment, Cynthia. Uh, guys, we're, let's get her on the phone or whatever we need to do, all right? We, have, we probably have to abandon Skype here. I don't know if it's system-wide in the country or if it's here, but it's it's with every person. Uh, uh, let's see if we can hear her now, and if not, we're going to get her on the phone. Go ahead, Cynthia. Okay, I'm just saying that I'm so happy that you are having me on the show, and I hope that I'm coming through now. Uh, yes, you are coming through. I mean, I really think we're, they're starting to mess with us. Roger Stone was on earlier. And when he comes on, sometimes someone jumps on his computer and is controlling the browser. I mean, this is really starting to happen. I think what we're seeing is some information warfare. But please continue. I apologize. Well, um, the, the situation with Trump and the riot that took place, let me first say, I'm not in the United States. For the past two weeks, I've been in Africa and I've been in Asia. And let me tell you that people are concerned about a the potential for a President Trump. And this stems from things that he has said or things that have reported he has reportedly said. At the same time, let me just remind folks that if you run a draw play too many times, then the defense is going to be able to tell when you're running a draw play. Now, this situation with the riot at uh, the, the campaign event, well, I'm here to tell you that this happened in my very own campaign. I remember. This happened actually twice. And so um, one time, the first time it happened, homeless people were told that I was giving away money and all they had to do was come to my campaign headquarters and collect a check, collect some cash. And of course, people, I mean, All right, we're having Skype problems with Cynthia McKinney. She's getting into dirty tricks, how these type of operations run. When her Skype comes back, we'll attempt to go to her, and then at break, we're going to attempt to get on a phone line with her. She's in Bangladesh, so that may be the reason we're having some Skype problems. But with Roger Stone, they've been breaking into his computers. Of course, he's one of the top Trump advisors, so what do you expect? I mean, he's the front runner 
of the so-called free world, and they are really coming after him. Uh, and absolutely, Trump does some things I disagree with, some things that scare people. The media also kind of misrepresents a lot of it. The bigger question I'm going to ask Cynthia McKinney is, why, did, why does she think the system across the board is so scared of him? But we'll get to that question in a moment. You, your Skype was cutting out again, Dr. McKinney. You were getting into, they sent the homeless claiming that you were offering free money. Please continue. And so eventually, I was totally embarrassed. All of the media were there to cover it. Um, and I, I was totally embarrassed. This is exactly a replay. This is an inst a not so instant replay of what happened to me. So I recognize it. And um, so the objective is to make Trump so unpalatable that one doesn't have any choice but to cast their vote for Hillary Clinton. And under no circumstance should any thinking voter vote for Hillary Clinton. Well, even Louis Farrakhan uh, has been saying good things about Trump overall uh, compared to the other establishment candidates, even though he disagrees with some of the things. And, of course, Trump obviously disagrees with some of the stuff Louis Farrakhan says. All I know is I've never seen the power structure so scared of somebody. What is your view uh, as somebody that's been inside Congress but also been all over the world, Dr. McKinney, of why the system's so scared of Trump? Well, you know, he, he, his instincts, um, he said something that caught my attention. Of course, he said a lot of things that caught a lot of attention, right? Okay. However, he started talking about NATO. You and I know that NATO is an anachronism. NATO should have been dismantled a decade ago or more. At the fall of the Soviet Union, that was basically the end of NATO, except for the fact that you've got a group of people who want to rekindle the, the Cold War. And so NATO is a vehicle by which they can accomplish that. And then NATO will try and keep cement together these uh, entities that are basically drifting apart. If you look at uh, what's happening in Europe today, and then... The sure, United he also States wants peace with Russia. I mean, that is such a big positive. That's right. And so now you've got NATO has become a global army yep. to um, uh, destabilize other parts of the world in pursuit of the Cold War against Russia and a, a hot war, it seems, against China. Migration is a human right. Migration is beautiful. Migration is beautiful. Migration is a human right. Trump's a Nazi. How, how, many, how many Jews has Trump killed? Huh? How many Jews has Trump killed? Oh, please. How many Polish gypsies? Oh, please. You stupid Shut up, bitch. Shut the fuck up. You know what's good for your health, homie? Trump, free all the homies. Fuck them all. Free all Chapo. Fuck the police. Que viva Mexico. Que viva Italia. Fuck them. Donald Trump. Fuck Donald Trump. Fuck Donald Trump. Fuck Donald Trump. Fuck Donald Trump. All right, what do you think is going to happen in like five minutes? In like five minutes, there's going to be pepper spray and riot gear running all through here. I hereby declare this to be an unlawful assembly. And in the name of the people of the state of California, demand all those assembled at fair and fair view to immediately disperse. Uh, word up, like, dude, he, he said that us Mexicans are bringing all types of bad people to this to this country. That's incorrect.
thought it was dying out, and then uh, looks like a kettling is happening at this point. Oh, they've been waiting for that guy. You know, that was a guy that uh, got a scuffle with him earlier. One of the Brown Beret guys right here. I know. There's not many people left, yeah. So it looks like they are picking out people to arrest at this point. are nothing but thugs and pigs. You can't tell me that you're here to protect anybody. Looks like at this point they're going to start picking out people that have been causing trouble throughout the day and probably grabbing them. I didn't say you were, but uh, that from their point of view, that's what they're picking up. Yeah, you're not that guy earlier. That guy they just arrested got in a scuffle with the cops earlier. Oh, but he was talking. He didn't swing at him. I, did, did I didn't he? say he did anything. Now, did he do anything to provoke him? Just now. Nah, I have it on video. Yeah. He wasn't doing anything. That's stupid. Sorry. So anyway, it's interesting. Now they're coming around the back. Like cockroaches under the cookie jar, the Obama administration is scurrying to blame anyone other than themselves for the complete failure that will go down as the fourth worst economic presidency in American history. Well, Michelle, I think what the president is referring to is something that he's observed before, which is that in the earliest days of his presidency, the, the country was facing a historically dire economic environment. The president and uh, his team uh, were rapidly responding to these crises and making difficult policy decisions that ultimately, here seven years later, have yielded tremendous progress. And, oh, well. I hear there's some hot shot uh, journalists here. You know, Josh was uh, speaking for me, and I want to make sure he was getting it right. As his final term ends, Obama is closing in on the embarrassing distinction of being the only U.S. president in American history to fail to oversee even one year of 3% economic growth. Jim Hoft of the Gateway Pundit writes, On Thursday, the Commerce Department announced that the U.S. economy expanded at the slowest pace in two years. GDP growth rose at an anemic 0.5% rate after a paltry 1.4% fourth quarter advance. Barack Obama will be lucky to average a 1.55% GDP growth rate. According to Lewis Woodhill, if the economy continues to perform below 2.67% GDP growth rate this year, President Barack Obama will leave office with the fourth worst economic record in U.S. history. Woodhill continues, this would place his presidency fourth from the bottom of the list of 39, above only those of Herbert Hoover at negative 5.65%, 
Andrew Johnson at negative 0.7%, and Theodore Roosevelt at 1.41%. I'm thinking about the year. I'm 19 and 29. Furthermore, Herbert Hoover's presidency began right at the beginning of the Great Depression. Andrew Johnson, Lincoln's vice president, only escaped the same fate as Honest Day because his would-be assassin, George Atzerodt, got drunk. Johnson then proceeded to oversee the mountainous task of reconstruction in the wake of the American Civil War, and Teddy Roosevelt became president after McKinley was killed by an anarchist. Having survived the Great Depressions of the 19th century, Roosevelt then went on to endure the Panic of 1907 and ensured future economic growth by waging war on corporate corruption by filing no less than 40 antitrust suits against the robber barons of the emerging 20th century. I am not leading this fight as a matter of aesthetic pleasure. I am leading because somebody must lead or else the fight would not be made at all. Obama simply inherited George Bush's baton of NAFTA-esque trade deals, but rather than diminishing the damage waged on the American worker, as he promised in his campaign speeches, Our trade agreements should not just be good for Wall Street, it should also be good for Main Street. And the problem that we've had is, is that we've had corporate lobbyists oftentimes involved in negotiating these trade agreements, but the AFL-CIO hasn't been involved, ordinary working people have not been involved, and we've got to make sure that our agreements are good for everybody because globalization right now is creating uh, winners and losers. But the problem is it's the same winners and the same losers each and every time. There's a reason this Trans-Pacific Partnership took five years to negotiate. I wanted to get the best possible deal for American workers, and that is what we've done. Obama expanded the trade deals into sovereign killing New World Order behemoths and promoted them in secret for the globalist corporate banksters that financed his career. It appears a disclaimer is in order. Considering the current climate, branding any open-minded discussion of, well, just about anything to be racist. In my humble opinion, Obama isn't the worst president in history because he is black. It's because he truly is perpetually mindful when it comes to responding to the will of the globalists and completely detached from the will of of the American people. John Baum for Infowars.com. Infowars. Hey, how's it going, man? All right, they're pushing down the barriers now and running over. Running past. Here it goes. All right, they've broken open the barrier and they're going inside. Excuse me? Excuse me? All right, they just said they were going to be arrested. Got people being triggered. Everybody go! So there's a mass of people up at the front. There it goes. Looks like they're coming walk forward, forward now. Right Let's now. walk forward! Push! Push! So they're at the front right now. You can see them. So they massed around there. Nobody's gotten into the hotel yet. The police are, people are listening to the police at this point, half of them. There it is, looks like they are storming the gates at this point. Oh. Oh. Hey, uh, 
um, I'm with the media. I don't want to get a pass. Um, not a pass to get inside, but you got to stay here? Okay. If somebody pushes me into you, just don't knock me in the face. <laughs> yeah. So the cops have pushed them back now from the front entrance. They pushed some people down. They're using their uh, they're throwing eggs now. I've seen a few eggs being thrown. People are going through the hedgerows right now. Right, they're pulling back. They're throwing eggs and they're pushing the protesters back at this time now. You see they're pushing them back in back into the street.
That's it for our show tonight. I'm Jakari Jackson from the InfoWars Command Center, and we'll see you again next week.